Are you ready to say goodbye to the constant ups and downs of the artist income roller coaster? Whether you're a full-time artist who wants to increase and stabilize your income, a part-time musician who wants to go full-time, or a hobbyist who needs to fund your passion projects, this podcast will equip you with the tools, resources, and inspiration to make it happen. My name is Bree Noble. I'm a musician, best-selling author, and educator whose mission is to help musicians like you to increase the income you're already making and tap into new income streams so you can create a more diverse, stable, reliable income from music and finally ditch the starving artist mentality. Now let's dive into the Profitable Musician Show. Hey, this is Bree Noble. I am so excited to be here with Lindy Vanestis of Create Financial Planning. And we're going to talk about financial planning for creatives and musicians. This is a topic I have literally never covered on my podcast. We've talked about income streams and all of the stuff around bringing income. We've even talked about some tax related things, but we've never really talked about financial planning and uh, just figuring out, you know, what's coming in and what's going out and how do you know if you're being profitable or not? And what are some tools that you can use around that? So I'm really excited to have Lindy with, with us. And before we jump into the questions, I'd just love to know a little bit, Lindy, about you, uh, why you started doing this for musicians and creatives, and just a little bit about your background. Thank you, Bree. Thank you so much for having me here today. I'm really excited to present first time too. My passion is around being accessible and available to help people. I've been in this industry a long time and I thought it was so unfair how somebody could only have access to advice if they already had their first million dollars. So I created Create Financial Planning to be a resource to people where they are. And I am a fee-only advisor, so I don't get commissions on, on, I don't try to sell products, or I'm just available on a planning basis to help people where they are. And it's, I love working with creatives. I have a talent to help people not be mad at money, but I don't have the same talent that you have. So I'm really excited to be a resource. Thank you. I love that your talent is to help people not be mad at money. Cause I do think <laughs> that's something I talk about in my money mindset boot camp is like how we think money is evil or we're mad at what it's done to people that we know, or we're mad at it because we don't understand it. Like there's so many reasons and we put all these things on money, but money itself is actually just a unit of exchange. Right. And we put all this heaviness around this thing and all it really is, it could be, it could be anything we're using to exchange. It could be, uh, I'm going to give you a glass of milk and you're going to give me a cookie. You know, it could be anything where we're just exchanging something for value. So I love that you say that. So I want to talk about with musicians, there are a lot of musicians that go through a feast or famine kind of experience. And some of it is our fault because we'll be like really you know go crazy we'll get all these gigs and then while we're in it we're never following up and getting more so then all of a sudden we have a big dry patch but sometimes it just has to do with seasonal things right um it has to do with summer is busier and holidays are busier and other things times like january are kind of dead so do you have any tips for really navigating this income, you know, influx and where it's like really high some months and really low other months. And also if you're like a freelancer and maybe you have big projects and then they end and all of a sudden you don't have any more clients, like how can you navigate that and get this even keel feeling with your money when you've got this roller coaster going on in the background? Right. Thank you, Bree. That's an Awesome question. And one thing I would tell people as a business owner myself is to always be in that gig acquisition mindset. Even when you are super busy, do set aside some time to be working on securing those next gigs. And I know sometimes you feel like you have so much going on, you can't even think about it, but that's really important to do that. As far as the feast and famine of the cash flow coming in, 
I like to think of it because it's sort of fun to be fancy once in a while as a three tiered tower of champagne glasses. The top tier is your necessity and the rest trickles down. So first we're gonna prioritize our necessities, food, shelter, utilities, health insurance. The second tier is where you pay debt and save. And the base tier is where you really can spread out more, enjoy that variable or non-essential lifestyle. You know what these are, regardless of what you tell yourself is essential, but this is how I'm visualizing this. So how to come about, what are our necessities? Well, you can list all of your expenses, write them down in one place that you can see, and I've made a money flow sheet that can be updated monthly. It helps to see patterns for you and to decide what is a necessity actually. In addition to listing all of your expenses, list all of your income. By doing this, you'll start to see trends if they are there and be able to see everything earned for the month and the year in one place versus having it be cluttered up in a checking account or on a credit card. As you come to know your necessities and your income, it would be nice if there was a rule of thumb that I could give you, an ideal to shoot for. You know, I wish there was a straightforward, one size fits all kind of umbrella formula for everyone, but it really depends on if you're a solo business owner acting as an LLC or if you have an S Corp, and also if one of your streams of income is a W-2 salary or hourly income. So the best recipe that I can come up with this is to try to have a category for your necessities of not having it be more than 50% of your income after your taxes are paid and you have saved. So for the first category of your necessities, trying to keep that at 50%. For the second category of saving, I'd say try to save at least 10% for yourself with a goal of 20. And I have met some super savers who are able to consistently save a quarter of their income. And remember the IRS? If you are self-employed, you'll owe 15.3% for self-employment taxes in addition to state and federal. So if you can, it's a good idea to save. Oh, this sounds so painful, but 30 to 40% of all earnings in a separate account just for taxes. If you're paying down debt, it's still important to save so that you don't have to rely on credit when that next thing happens because that thing is always around the corner whether it's new tires or a new mic or whatever so having a goal for savings an actual goal it's easier to save when you say i'm trying to save fifteen thousand dollars than when you say i'm saving for an emergency like what does that mean that's not a goal it doesn't it might be easy to see that account growing and spend it if you don't have that goal have your savings be liquid, not something that's at risk. Consider using a high interest savings account if it's at a different place than your current checking. Sometimes that little bit of extra work to move money means it might be more likely to stay there. And remember why you have the savings. Is it there as a buffer for those slow months and or for the future goal? like buying a house and keeping in mind that it will make it easier to let it grow and not spend it on online shopping or at happy hour or on something spontaneous. And so that in that month with lower income, when you go to the buffer account to cover the necessities for that month, you still feel safe and okay. So to start that buffer savings, you'll if you have seasonally changing income, like you mentioned, You've saved for retirement, taxes paid yourself, and your business expenses. In the months with more income, so you have a big month, put the rest in the buffers to make sure that it is smooth and to lower out the, to even out the lower income months. And that'll depend on your business. It may be 
feel good for you to have three months of income, especially if you're married or have another reliable source of income, or maybe if you're single and it's just you, uh, you might wanna have a six month in the buffer for both your business savings account and for your personal emergency fund. I have two more things I wanna talk about savings. So the buffer emergency account is where you, is that, is that where you want it? Have you saved everything there? and you feel like you still have money to spare, this, uh, I hear angels singing. Like, <laughs> you don't wanna hear me singing, but I hear angels. So you, my friend, have hit wealth. Start saving into a brokerage account. Money and savings in cash does not keep up with inflation. So the, the a goal here is to not actually have too much in cash because it can hurt you long term. Talk with an advisor to make sure you invest in a way that feels really comfortable for you because we know the market is up and down and the last thing you need is to be worried about that, to understand what you're doing and why. Make sure that your cash is meeting your short term and long term goals. And this is a good way to move forward if you do, don't have an immediate short-term goal that will re require a lot of cash, like a home down payment, for example. And then the last thing, we just mentioned wealth, being able to consistently live within your means and have some money left over every month that comes from prosperity. When you are overall earn more than what you need to live, when you have a sense of abundance, a feeling of positive flow. By doing these steps, I hope you feel both wealth and prosperity. Now, the third thing I mentioned after paying for your necessities and saving was those more fun lifestyle. So now that you're truly prepared, let's go down to the party, the base layer of our champagne tower, and remember that we are in this industry. We do this work, this craft, because we are passionate about it. And so we can do fun things. Of the three things, necessities, savings, and lifestyle, this, this lifestyle is equally important. I call it my soul candy. It's maybe actually doing the work is soul candy, but for me, it's also being able to afford to go to your show and being able to dance and to live in that prosperity. So, what we want to think about here is after you've covered your basic needs and saved for those dips in income have some fun <laughs> yes have some fun and my very vague rule of thumb that i can't actually make because you are unique and your business is unique and you deserve unique advice however in this category it could grow to be as much as 30 percent of your take-home pay if we look now again at our champagne glass tower, it's seeing money move from Maslow's hierarchy. If Maslow were at a party on his head, upside down, right? We're covering your basic needs first, have two consumer debt and three to six months of save to cover you during slow times, and you're living your best life. Just a quick note, don't feel entitled to always live your best life right now. Pay your future self. Imagine a three-year-old running around with your wallet. That is exactly what is happening right now if you're not saving for the future. Plan to take care of yourself when you're older. Then you can act like a crazy kid again. And when your basic needs are met and your emergency fund is full, then treat yourself. Trickle down economics with champagne right? Oh my so, God. I love that. So Brie, I have a couple of two people I'd like to tell you about. Would you like to hear their stories and what their cash flow looks like? I definitely would. And I just wanted to mention, first of all, about the soul candy. I love that. Um, I love that your point is that the whole point of all of what we're doing is to be able to have that money to do the fun stuff. And for musicians, the fun stuff might be recording a new album that you're not sure is, you know, going to be like viable in the market, but you just want to record it anyway. You're not, you know, it's an experimental or maybe it's, 
uh, buying that new guitar that you really want, even though you don't need because you have five other ones, but you really love guitars, you know? So think about what that would be for you. And then think about that as you listen to these stories of some people that really got their cash flow in order. Awesome. So here's a real life example of what that money flow that I just spoke about looks like. Risa has multiple streams of income. She she owns an LLC and one of her gigs also is an hourly W2 income with very flexible hours and schedule because music is her number one priority. Risa's fixed expenses for her lifestyle are $2,500 a month all in for her basic food and shelter and utilities. This month was stellar. She earned a total of $15,000 from her business. She deposited all of her income from gigs into her business checking account. And then the W-2 income is deposited into her personal checking account. Then she'll transfer $2,500 from, from her business to her checking, her personal, to cover her personal expenses as a business, an owner's draw, or because she's an LLC, so she gets to take an owner's draw. What she'll do with the rest, because she's an LLC and not an S Corp, is she could save 10% towards her retirement from either account, personal or business, but for best practices, she should do it from her business account because if she decides to change to an S Corp, it could cause a mixing of assets and she could lose some tax advantages that we get into later. So Risa is gonna send $1,500 or 10% to her retirement account, plus she'll save 10% or more of her W-2 earnings from her personal account into like an IRA or a Roth or something like that. Riza and all of you with an LLC should save, like I said before, like 30 to 40% for taxes. And if you're paying the burden of both the employee and the employer for things like Social Security and Medicare, it's important not to be surprised by taxes. I've been there. It's best, Don't do it. Yeah. It's best to pay these quarterly. So so you also don't get dinged by the IRS and get a penalty. So this was a really good month for her. She's going to send 4500 of her business to her business savings to pay those quarterly taxes. Not every month will be that high, but it's a percent of what was brought in from the business. Most months it's less, but then Risa pays her business expenses, which are about $2,000 a month from this business checking account, 2000. And so what's left? She's paid herself by saving, done an owner's draw, paid the business expenses and saved for taxes. So she's got about 4,500 left over. So she can see if she's got her comfort zone in both of her business buffer and her personal buffer savings account. And she can put it where she needs it most if she needs to take an additional owner's draw. If, if this has been the first big check in a few months, she might need to replenish that. If her accounts are where she wants them, then she could invest more in her business, in herself, or take, another's, uh, take another owner's draw and start investing in the market. Another client that I have, Yasmina, has an escort. So she is a different situation completely. She has three options which she can pay herself from e giving herself a salary. You can take a loan from an S Corp too. And you also can do an owner's draw. I'm sorry, a do, um, what is it called? A bonus as a distribution if the company is profitable at the end of the year. So S Corps use payroll and the company pays their share of taxes and your income taxes will be deducted from your income through the payroll system and you'll receive a W-2 and a K-1, all these fun tax forms. When you have an S Corp, it's important that you pay yourself enough or it will be looked at as a little shady to the IRS. And so how do you know what is enough? It's not an official IRS rule, but 
it's called the 60-40 rule and how it works of, of all the pay that you're gonna receive for this year, if you pay 60% of your business income to yourself in the form of an employee's salary, so if Yasmina thinks she's gonna earn 80,000 this year, she'll receive 60% of that or 48,000 a year or 4,000 a month as salary. Then the rest, she'll pay herself 40% of her business income as a profit distribution, also known as a bonus. The bonus will make up the rest of Yasmina's 80,000 for the year, which is a bonus of 32,000 taken whenever she wishes. Why this is smart and attractive is these profit distributions avoid the 15% self-employment tax and are what make an S-Corp attractive. And then another question is like, well, how do I decide what is a reasonable salary? It's the, again, there's no hard, fast rule of thumb, but it's roughly about 10% of the business's receipts. And it also includes what the company paid for you for health insurance and any other benefits that you have. Be sure to work with a CPA to make sure you're paying yourself. If not, it's really a red flag. So, wow. That was a lot. And yes, I, I get this like so much because I became an S Corp last year in 2020 and I had been being a sole proprietor and wow, like I'm so glad I did it because last year was a little bit painful with the taxes because yeah. of that extra percentage for the, the self-employed tax. So I definitely, I think you guys should look into this, but on the other hand, do you have a recommendation on like how much you should be making before that's really worth switching because i i held on a really long time as a sole proprietor well if you're going to be able to save seven and a half percent on 40 percent of your taxes i mean that's like it's a weird mathematical yes. question right <laughs> but i think if if you were so the thing is, I'd say to offer you to do TurboTax for free if you earned under $50,000, but you can't do TurboTax for free because you're self-employed and anything where you need a Schedule C or a Schedule E, they won't allow you to do it. So I don't know where everybody's coming from, but I live in Minneapolis, which is a pretty metropolitan area. And I pay about $300 for a CPA to do my taxes. Yep. So I think they're totally worth it. And I'm self-employed, you know, she's, she's doing all the stuff for me. And I pay way more that, than that in quarterly taxes. So I'd say it's worth it to hire a CPA, right? Yeah. I think so. Yeah. I mean, I did my own taxes for a long time because I was an accountant um, in a form. Oh, so but, you have that special skill. Yeah. You have, well, <laughs> I, I'm not a tax accountant, but I definitely didn't. I wasn't afraid of it. You know, when I was doing TurboTax myself, but at, at this point I was just like, no, like the reason I switched in order to become an S-Corp is because I wanted to save that money and I could see where I was at the point where it was going to save me enough. And I think for me, it was probably when I hit um you know making making six figures okay it's kind of when it was it was right for me but it depends on if you have employees and all of that stuff as well um because there's some payroll expenses but i don't know maybe this might be a little beyond some of the people listening to this podcast it's definitely something to think about down the road um but i i'm glad that you mentioned that self-employment tax because the first time that i had to pay it i was a little bit shocked <laughs> <laughs> so I think it's good to know about that. Um, I know you have a, a spreadsheet that you created to help people with cash flow. You want to talk a minute about that, just how they can use this to kind of figure out what's coming in in the different months when things aren't level and, and how they yeah. can do that? Yeah. So I know that many musicians have multiple gigs, side hustles. And so some tips for navigating, keeping track of money coming in from multiple sources would be to use a cash flow tracking system. I have built my cash flow worksheet, which is 
so makes the world so simple for me as, as a visual person it I have put in a tab for if you have multiple gigs what and you can make all of those sources and figure out where your money's coming in this month and how much to expect this month from each of your gigs and then you can keep track of that for the whole year and in addition to that it has a tab where you can put in what your business expenses are and your personal expenses that are fixed and then your variable and it's based on that 50 30 20 budget that i spoke about or cash flow system but there's a page called the money map where it visually shows you how much you have coming in then what your fixed expenses are, what your personal expenses and your business, and then what's left over. And then from there, I like to use a zero dollar planning. So the goal is that there is money left over, right? <laughs> and then to be, so to have your money work for you instead of you working for money. So there's gonna be hopefully a number left over and we're gonna bring that down to zero by telling it where to go. Do you still have student loan debt? Do you have any other, is your emergency fund where, do you want this loan? Do you wanna save for a down payment? Do you wanna save for a trip? Do you wanna save for a new piano? What is? What are the goals? And you literally tell your money where to go and how to work for you. And what's so beautiful about it is it's just all on one page and it's pretty colors, <laughs> <laughs> but more than that, it's something might feel like a competing priority. And here you can say, this is how much I can afford to do this month. And you can save a new version every month and, and know how, to watch your progress and see yourself meeting your goals. Or if you consistently save this much, you can say, in nine months, I'll have enough for that full down payment and really be able to have some tangible goals set up. So it's really powerful. So another thing, so there's that cash flow worksheet. If you want a copy of that, email me at Lindy, which my name is L-I-N-D-Y at createfp.com. C R L I N D Y at C R E A T E F P like financial planning dot com and I will happily share a copy with you. So happy to do that. The other thing I would say is when you get a check, know where they're being deposited and what you want to save and pay for with them. And remember taxes aren't a surprise that they are eternal, so save for them. And when big checks come in, remember it's not a windfall or found money. They are part of your plan and so treat them the same, which leads me to say, be ready for months with less or no income. It won't sting as much with your buffer accounts in place. Yeah, just like saying that a tax refund is not a windfall either. That's just getting your money that you should have had in the first place because you paid a little bit too much. So yeah. don't think of that as like, oh my gosh, free money. No, that's <laughs> your money that you should have. And you know, you should you should distribute it accordingly, right? Mm -hmm. Exactly. So what are some things that you see people miss as far as like tax, um, tax write-offs and advantages that you can take as a self-employed person or an LLC or a uh, S Corp if you're at that level um, that you see people missing or that maybe if they were a little more organized, they could be doing better on, on taking advantage of those. Yeah, I have a list of like 15 of them. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. So, so basically the self-employment tax, home office, internet and phone bills, health insurance premiums, meals if they're for entertainment and part of your work, travel, make sure to keep accurate records of your travel, even if it's in your car, because you can be reimbursed like over 57 cents per mile. So that's a big deal if you're, your actual vehicle use, interest that you're paying on things associated with your business, publications and subscriptions, ongoing education for your career, business insurance, rent, startup costs, advertising, retirement plan contributions, 
The other thing is that uh, S corps can take uh, S corporations can be able to take a qualified business income deduction and deduct up to 20% of their business income in addition to the write-offs listed above that we just talked about, right? So this deduction this deduction is taken off of your tax return, not the businesses. So that's important to know. And then ways to reduce your self-employment tax are within reason and because it makes sense, but increase your business expenses. I can't believe I'm saying that, but that's a way to right? add to your expenses, but not just increase them, but be wise about it. For example, pay your health insurance through your company. This is often a credit, a credit to your taxes. A credit is applied directly to your taxes, reducing the tax bill owed. It has more impact than a deduction to your income. So also be mindful to pay yourself enough to not get noticed by the IRS and also to make sure you make enough to qualify for your own social security. So in 2021 this year, that amount is you have to earn $5,880. And this can be salaries, commissions, tips, vacation and severance pay. So what is not considered income by the social security is investment earnings loans or gifts received and then a way that you can reduce your federal taxes is by saving more for retirement but Bree, that's a whole other podcast okay. I, i'm sure it is that is very true um a quick question that came up for me was um is there a way to uh, how was i going to word this um if you shoot, it's not coming to me at the moment, but um, basically, oh, I know if you um, are paying yourself a salary and then you also are getting a, a bonus, right? Cause you're, you're an S corp, let's say. And does that go toward the social security or does that not, do they not count that because it's profit taking? I would love to get back to you on that. <laughs> that is not something I am prepared with an answer for right now. Well, that's good because I that just came to me. So yeah, uh, I will find I that out have for you. No idea about that either, and I've been curious about it. So yeah. Um. So as far as my my feeling is though that you know based on what we just spoke about is that salaries, commissions, tips. So yeah, let me, I feel like it would count towards, towards social security, but let me find out. For, of course, we are not accounting professionals, so don't. Yes, I am not an attorney and I am not a CPA. Me so, <laughs> <laughs> so um, as far as retirement, I know there's like a million options out there for self-employed and we don't have to go into this super deep because like you said, it's a whole nother podcast. Um, but do you have any suggestions? I know for me, I have an IRA. Um, and you know, my husband's got his own retirement as well. Are there any things we should be looking at as self-employed as far as the best way to save for retirement? Yes. And again, the question is really variable depending on the person and their level of income tax bracket. The one thing I want people to be aware of, and again, I'm not a CPA, but I feel like a lot of CPAs think their job is to save you taxes this year. Mm. And in the planning that I do with people, I am seeing some massive tax burdens when they're in their 70s and 80s. And so to be able to balance and have your income your savings in multiple buckets where you might have your, so an IRA usually you've saved before you've paid t taxes on it. You've effectively lowered your tax rate for that year. You put it in your taxes forms that I saved into an IRA and it lowers your income for this year, lowering your taxes. So that's one option. That is called deferred income. So basically you are going to take that income later and pay income taxes on it later, <laughs> right? So it's lowered your tax bracket for this year, 
but we don't know what our taxes are going to look like when we're in our 70s and 80s. I wish that when I got my CFP, my Certified Financial Planner designation, it came with a crystal ball, but I think they were out that day. So I don't know what the market's going to do or what the taxes are going to do down the road. So saving in deferred ways, you can also save in a brokerage account, which you would have access to forever at any time. There's no rules about when you can take it. That has income taxes on it for things like interest and dividends that you earned, and then capital gains. So that has a little bit less tax than your 401k or IRA might have because those capital gains taxes are less usually than income taxes. And then the last tax bucket would be a Roth or something that you've saved after taxes. The, the current laws, and I don't see them changing it, but that you will never have to pay any taxes on the growth or anything that you pull out of there because you saved with after-tax money. Um, but then ways that are available for business owners to save in a tax-advantaged way or after taxes, you can set up a solo 401k for your business. You can set up a SEP IRA a simple IRA, a regular IRA, a Roth IRA, and they all have different rules and they're really, there's a lot to look into to make sure that it's the right thing. So there is there is a plethora of options available for everyone. And again, it's not like one size fits all. Yeah, definitely, you know, it, I've always been like, oh my gosh, should I do Roth? Should I do regular? You know, all of that, because you really don't know the future. It's very, very okay. true. So I would definitely, you know, consult a, a professional on this, but just know that like, just because you don't work for a company doesn't mean you can't save for retirement. And, you know, there's a lot of options for us. Yeah. And actually the reason that the 401k came about was because people used to have a pension. Mm -hmm. And then when companies stopped making pensions so readily available, some lucky people still do get a pension, right? But they just, they created the IRA and the 401k to move that responsibility of saving onto the individual because they weren't expect, companies weren't taking on that burden anymore. So it really is important to know that you are responsible for your welfare. But it does put more control into your hands. You know, you can trust yourself, hopefully, versus trusting a company that could potentially lose your pension. You know, that's yes. So and I know, and that's something that I am always conscious of when I'm doing a plan too, because they are so great when they work and we want them to be there for you, but it's it's not guaranteed. Yep, absolutely. So, so is there anything else we haven't covered? I feel like we've covered so much, but I wanna make sure that the, if there's anything else you've got on your list that we need to cover in, in this episode. Um, I have one thought is that um, the, having different buckets for tax savings and emergency fund it's a it's a good idea to again have that that rule of thumb sort of in the back of your mind always but everyone has a different business structure so do try to always save at least 10% for yourself up front 30 to 40% for taxes and then having that lifestyle of 30% for fun, hopefully. So the way it works out is your business is paying your 10% for your savings and 30% for taxes and its expenses. And then you're getting paid. And then you're gonna pay half of your, half of that money should go to your fixed lifestyle. 30% for fun, hopefully, and 20% more for savings. So you're actually saving more than 20%, right? Mm. Um, Another thing is, are there any disadvantages financially to being self-employed? And one is that we, we talked a little bit about that 
both you and your business are paying half of your Social Security and Medicare taxes. Normally, a W-2 employer would pay half of that for you. So that's where the full burden comes out for you. Um, so make sure that you're saving that. And then the good news is that the employer portion that you've paid as a self-employed person will be a federal deduction for you. So you do get some breaks on that. Remember to pay quarterly taxes and pay enough. Um, it's possible you could qualify for a free turbo tax if potentially, but um, maybe not as a, because we're awesome business owners, right? Um, another disadvantage is that there isn't an established savings plan in place like we just spoke about. So be sure to save for your own future in the way that makes the most sense for you over the term of your life. And if that takes talking to somebody about how to do that. Um, another possible disadvantage is the flexibility. Can you handle it? Or are you super pro, right? And then the final disadvantage is that you are your everything, your marketing, sales, PR, president, bookkeeper, secretary, bottle washer, main act, custodian, scheduler, until you can afford to hire somebody. And that's a huge decision too, right? To bring somebody in to do those things for you. So that's a powerful feeling because you are both supporting yourself and another person is relying on you. So that's really exciting. And then, so I know we just covered the cons, but one thing I wanna say is I love, love being self-employed for a million, <laughs> a million reasons. One of which is the confidence and the faith in my own work and ethic. And I always thought that having a job or working for somebody meant security. And I finally, took a leap of faith to start my own business and I've never been happier and I realized that security is what you make. So you deserve to work with your values and the reasons that drive you. And that my friend is worth a champagne toast right there. Sadly, I have water, but <laughs> maybe later we can do this in person. <laughs> Lastly, I was hoping to give you a simple rule today. Save this much, spend this much, put it here. But the truth is each one of us has a completely different business and life. And the simple rule is you are unique. You deserve unique advice tailored to your life and your business. And I'm not saying you have to work with me, but please do work with a professional planner like myself, as well as a CPA, a bookkeeper and an attorney. Yeah, thank you, Brie, and thank you, Fee Musicians, for having me, and I hope I give something of value today that makes your life truly celebratory. So this is amazing. You are so welcome. I'm so glad we finally covered this subject on the show. Um, you guys, reach out to her. Uh, send her an email at lindy at createfp.com. Is that correct? Yeah. And her website is createfp.com. Uh, check out her services there. Like she said, if, whether it's her or someone else, I would connect with somebody just to make sure that you've got your financial house in order because especially as you grow your business, because there are a lot of things that, you know, we don't, we're not automatically learning these along the way and people aren't just out there giving us all the information. Some of this stuff is really complicated and I wish it wasn't, but taxes and you know retirement and none of that is is easy so we need somebody that it's their job to learn all the intricacies of this stuff and that's why you'd want to reach out to someone like lindy so you definitely want her cash flow spreadsheet as well that's going to help you out so email her at lindy at f uh, create f p.com. Thank you so much, Lindy. I really appreciate all the thought you put into your answers today and that we were able to really uncover a lot of things that musicians need to know about their business. Thank you, Brie. It was really fun and an honor. Thank you. Thanks for listening to the Profitable Musician Show. I would love to know your takeaways and aha moments from this episode. Leave me a comment over at ProfitableMusician.com so I can bring you more of the information, interviews, and resources that you love. Thanks to Rondi Fay, one of my Academy members, for providing the music for our podcast. 
You can check her out at rondifay.com. That's R-A-N-D-I-F-A-Y.com. Just remember, knowledge is power, but without implementation, it is useless. And inspiration without action is merely entertainment. But I know you're not just a dreamer, you are a doer. And I promise I'll be here every week to support you and remind you that you can be a profitable musician.